Well, thank you all for being here. I'm going to be reading from my new book from Dos Madres Press, which had its inception at a dune shack in Provincetown that just happened to coincide with uh, the 2011 Halloween Nor'easter, which in Massachusetts, in the town that I live in, Central Mass, dropped 17 inches of heavy, wet snow on Halloween. And in Provincetown was a wind and rainstorm just short of a hurricane. So I went with my husband. We were dropped off there with a week's worth of supplies, a week's worth of water and food, no refrigeration, no electricity, no phone service, no cell service. And the only way out was to walk across the dunes for about a half an hour. So at some point during the residency, we heard that this storm was coming along. And I thought, well, in our Easter, you know, three days of rain, so what? Uh, and a neighbor came in boarding up the shack, and he said, well, do you want to ride out? You could spend the night in a hotel. And we say, oh, no, no, we don't want that. We'll be fine. So <laughs> and then when the storm hits, it was too late to do anything. So the, the wind, I mean, the rain's going sideways, the sand's going sideways. At one point, it pried open a window in the shack, which we ratcheted shut with some wires. But really, the worst thing was all night long, we're going <laughs> like this, the whole shack. It was, it was crazy. We thought we were going to die. Steve says, well, shall we sleep in our shoes? And I said, well, what for? There's no place to go. Um, so short, I mean, uh, long story short, the morning came. We were fine. Nothing had happened. Um, the residency people came, picked us up, took us to the car. We drive home clueless to increasing devastation. We see whole full maples and oaks where their limbs were just ripped off them. We see cars abandoned in the streets. We see power lines in the streets. There was no power anywhere. But again, we climb the hill up to our little hill town of Shutesbury, and by some miracle, we have power. So nothing happened. Um, but it, the whole experience became a wake-up call for me because I was 59 years old and I felt like I'd been living my life in a kind of illusion of safety, of security, an illusion that laws could be trusted, that people could be trusted, that there weren't any abuses of power. All this stuff was starting to bubble up. So on that note, I'm just going to start. The wind cries around the eaves, around the vent pipe, around the stove. Little lost wind, let me in, let me in, pounding on the window frames, kicking at the door. Gulls drop suicidally into the waves. I can't tell the white caps from the gulls, my thoughts from the surf. Just as I was thinking, don't see any seals, two surfaced in front of me, watching. A crow, a crow, a crow, what business does a crow have to do with the sea? I have my notebook and my tea. Down in the dune shack, you are dreaming. The world is flying away. Pilgrim Monument holds court over the horizon. I'm reading Daniel Berrigan's trial for burning draft papers, and I have to ask, what have I done in my life that was right and good? Sleep soundly now. I promise you, in the morning, someone will bang at the door with a fistful of poems, receive them like a gust of seagulls, like blowing sand. On the clothesline, my turtleneck flings one arm around itself. Janet, why don't you embrace yourself? We're all just empty wind, you, me, and this shirt flapping out of its mind, madly in love with itself. In the shack, there was a wood stove. In the middle of the night, we hear this horrendous shrieking. We get up. We don't know what we're expecting to see. There's nothing happening. And we realize it's the wind blowing across the top of the pipe like a stove, I mean, like a flute. Um. We can't go out. The wind is fierce. The grass blade draws its circle in the sand. The sleeper's face against the glass. The fire is on. The stove is out. We dance with arms around each other, spinning dervishes. The stovepipe blasts. It is a whistle, and the whistler is the wind, the earth, a single shaking room. The floorboards torque, the doors unhinge, and all the letters I ever sent you tumble in like bits of acorns. 
Why are we quarreling over which log to burn? Burn all these words. They're cluttering my good mind. All those emails waiting for me at home. There's a lifetime of reading right here. You start with me. I'll start with you. Open dunes are as lovely as open meadow. There is a wildness to them, a shifting gaze, while all the world tracks through. The world tracks through, though we have thrown away our money and our clothes, the wildness in us and shifting sand. A shifting path, the way in is shorter than I thought and longer than you did. Though we've been here before, we could lose our way. We could lose ourselves, fall down again dreaming in heavy sand while sightseers pass by without knowing the way. Without knowing the way, we've come home again, walked around back, found the latch to the gate, swung the door open. The strange thing about the dune shack is you're in the national seashore there, and it's public land, and everybody can just come walking through, and the dune shack had a solar shower, outdoor solar shower, and you, you know, you could be out there taking a shower and someone would just come tromping through. So uh, I got about a third of a book's worth of material from the, from the dune shack, and I was so scattered trying to write there because of the weather um, that everything was just very fragmented, and for that reason, I started putting these, um, these lines into, into huzzles, because a huzzle, they're standalone stanzas, you don't, each one kind of is its own little mini poem. So from there I started pulling material from years of going out west with my husband. Uh, my father had spent summers out there every year of his life um, mapping geology, it never took us, so I had this yearning for that area. So, so I'm fast forwarding across the country into the west. And plus now that the national parks and national monuments and national lands are all under siege, it all takes on a new urgency. Hobnobbing with the lords of chaos. I sat in the burnt out stump of some huge pine, seeking protection in a fire pit, my head bundled up against the wind. I was a gargoyle fanning volcanic vents, grinning in my charcoal kiln, my charred house and chimney. Blake said, energy is eternal delight. Go try to restrain desire, but who restrains the bee set loose in fury on the flower? Who restrains the fire? Here they are, the lords of chaos, stirring the pot that I am in, the pot that I am stirring too. It was me, but I was them. Why am I surprised to be displaced again? One hand puts my house in order while the other knocks it down behind my back. This next poem comes out of McGee Creek, which is a, I think it's a national forest property on the east side of the Sierras, which if you catch it just right, it has the most astounding wildflowers. McGee Creek. We are still not out of the flowers at the end of the trail to the high valley where sluggish hypnotized bees pollinate in pots of nectar knee-deep in lupins and fireweed. We could be Adam and Eve, so robed in beauty, all we could desire of wind, light, and rushing streams. Dark faces greet us. They're seated along the side making lunch, trail crew of convicts, all black, all young, the armed sheriff with skin like ours. One looks up, says, hello, I'm William. We nod. I want to reply. I want to say, I'm Janet. I'm so sorry. I'm afraid to speak, hardly look him in the eye, the young man in the flowers. And we thread between my husband and I. We cannot go back. It is time to leave. Not by right or possession do we walk free while our brothers are chained, yet children of the garden nonetheless. That really happened, and it was just so, it was just, I don't even know how to describe it. Um, 
So I'll read from the title poem, Waiting to be Born, which got its start from a dream I had of walking along a grassy track, which I might have pulled out of the hills of California. I'm not sure. It could be New England. I don't know. Walking along a grassy track, and in the dream, I know that there's a track parallel to this, and on that track is a mountain lion who is following me, and that sooner or later, the two tracks will converge. Waiting to be born. I don't want to see a mountain lion or feel it watching me, but the long grass parts for the lioness until I lay down and bare my neck to her. Sometimes you look straight at a thing and know that it is calling you and know it is time to leave your first life behind. Was that me sleeping in my own mind's eye? Was I waiting again to be born? Through the windows of a ruin, the sea is so blue I could dip my brush in it. A spider reels out a lifetime of silk. A honey-like sap comes from the magay tree. The Maya made paint from flowers and licked the brushes clean. Oh, Janet, you need one more line about the sweetness of things. The carpenter has only one last nail to drive into the sea, and then it is his. The Maya really did make paint from flowers and really did lick the brushes clean. It seemed like such a a sensual, essential kind of action. So in the days before GPS and cell phones and computers and all of that, when we would go out west, we would go with all these Peterson guides, guide to rocks, guide to birds, guide to trees, guide to flowers. They were very heavy. Um, (laughs) They were really heavy. The real work. In the dark ages, people no longer parsed thoughts on the razor of logic, but instead sought signs analogies, balance. Not words, but icons. Agassiz watched as the scales and flesh fell off a decaying trout, leaving the bones, and then he knew all there was to know about fish. The fir tree is known by its cones, sticky and upright as Christmas bulbs, but the real work of learning is here between you and me. Why love this field guide around anymore? It's a rock, and I don't know the difference between what I learned and what I made up. Sit down and look up. Thought and vision melt together with the wine-red penstemon, more lovely than any word. The older I get, the less I know what I have learned and what I make up. So it's it's happening. So we also spent some time in Sedona, which is just a beautiful, it's so beautiful. It's such a, you know, if landscape can be spiritual, it just utterly is, but it's so overdeveloped too. Oh, I don't know. Great spines of red rock and golden piers of sunlight, thunder rolls across golf courses over the arc lights of parking garages. What to do about the heavy equipment and thick, close bushes snorting, that sound of roots and earth being torn up and tossed asunder? Someone has made a Buddha pile under a recessed canyon wall. Someone has painted spirals, siphoning energy from past ages. How can we not be astonished at the tribe of river boulders wading in water The whole rushing world moves round them. Trees bud out in the canyons, damp secret places for bathers and beer cans, and so many people that desperation wears a track in the stone. Oh, I don't know about this poor country. I don't know how the earth can hold so many motherless people in its arms. I wish I were less worried or less constrained. The man asks, how far away is civilization? How can I answer? I don't even know my own name. 
So we're on this trail in Sedona, and this family comes trooping by, and the man turns and says, how far away is civilization? <laughs> Which I thought was a good question then, and I think it's a really good question now. <laughs> um, this poem comes out of Chiricahua National Monument in the very south of Arizona, uh, which is known for these just gigantic uh, stone pillars. They're really almost the size of an industrial smokestack. They're huge. And it's also reputed, well, I don't know if it's even reputed, maybe it's known, as one of the last hiding places for Cochise, the Apache chief, and I think also Geronimo. So this is called uh, Easter Sunday at Chiricahua. It's Easter, and the wind has risen in a flash of wings. Follow me up the stone steps, and I will show you the royal columns of Apache kings. Some muscular will heaved up the plains into mountains, carved them into 10,000 chimneys, and then invoked a fireplace heat to draw them skyward. You see the laminations as if laid down by a good bricklayer, a man who knew something about smelters and slathering mortar, while inside the cooks and boilers and steamers toiled, reworking the oars into a higher order. Jesus could light the great angels of this place, though in his absence the world would still be lit with its slow intelligences. The sky is the vault, the earth the footprint, the ponderosa agave, hummingbirds, lizards, and immense chimney rocks, the manifested thought. Like all the dispossessed, the Apache climbed the slow stones, leading their horses and children, holding their staves in the clear air of the surrounding desert. I am what I have been made, and I walk forward according to that design. Those who drink water, let them have rivers, and those who eat deeply, let them feast. For those with nothing, let them sharpen their senses to a burn on the wind. Heart of Rocks, this also came out of Chiricahua. Finally, we come to the bowl, cupped in the hands of silence, hands of warm stone, the wings of vultures, layer upon layer of rock so concentrated that radiance drips down to our upturned faces. The silent inhabitants, the spiny lizards with shimmering sky scales, so lovely, so outside us. We entered through the heart, but did not know it. We entered, but now it is late, and darkness pools on the stairs. Soon enough, we will return to water and food, but here we are guests at the table where inner knowing and outward form rise up and meet in a tall blue flame. So I'll finish with a poem that came more or less from this area, not New York, I mean my home area, which is Massachusetts called Elegy. It's dusk and we're walking away. The trees are unbearable, shoots of new growth gleaming. But we have to get back. We can't stay here. We're hurrying home with the sunset behind, lest we fall down again dreaming and lose our way, having forgotten why we came out to begin with. And afterwards, you will say, I didn't know there was a sun dog. And I will say, yes, yes, I saw one. You were looking the other way. Here's a burning bush, mustard yellow, who knows what kind, in a field of burning bushes. And now we are running with the fire behind us. Once, a large meteor passed through a cleft in the hills, utterly silent while we stood in the darkness. Did we see that, we asked? Did we? Did we? Thank you.